Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom you raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is the word of the Lord. Day and thank you to our worship team and all of our teams. We thank you for your service that you bring to God every week. The uh, so far in First uh, Thessalonians, we've been considering various characteristics of the church. For instance, last time we examined the doctrine of God, uh, choosing a people for Himself, called the doctrine of election. Today we're going to look at another quality of the church, and that's sharing the gospel with the lost world, that is evangelism. I was thankful to sing the song, Take the Name of Jesus With You, a favorite of uh, probably one of the greatest evangelists I've ever met. That's uh, Reverend Dr. Umar Garbaduce, his favorite song, and he took the name of Jesus with him everywhere he went. So world evangelism, local and world evangelism is the theme for today. One of the other themes that we have talked about, and we will expand on it later on as we go through 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, is the whole truth of union with Christ, being in Christ. This is the power base. This is where we live as as believers, and out of which um, we minister uh, to the lost world, out of this truth, union with Jesus Christ. Keep that in the back of your minds today as well. So let's, um, <clears throat> we're going to take a look at this theme of evangelism and focus upon certain characteristics of a heart of evangelism, a heart given to evangelism. What does that look like? And so that, that's going to be our text for today and our theme. The, uh, <clears throat> the question we will get to in a moment, but now we must pray and ask God for help. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you would help us to hear the word uh, spoken today. And I must confess, Lord, that I am a very poor uh, vessel. I ask that you would help me, help me, Lord, to say that which is true. Straighten out the bent words before they hit ears, Lord. I'm a sinner yet saved by grace, and I need your power every day to overcome. So, Lord, have at us through your word. Build us up in the most holy faith. Let us evangelize with an increasing passion. And we pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As a, I need to continue to grow as a student of church history and history in general. I was reading a while ago about a man named Peter Waldo. Peter Waldo. And um, about the year 1176, this guy was converted. And uh, he decided to give away his worldly goods. He was observing what was going on in the church of the time, the Pope, Rome, the whole deal. And he said, you know, these people... They're not, um, they're really into worldly goods and um, uh, things that don't make sense. So he decided to give away his worldly goods and to lead a simple life of poverty and preaching. And so soon he was joined by others 
and um, who were dissatisfied with Rome and its corruption. Remember, this is before the Reformation, 1176, not yet 1517. This is 1176, and this is Peter Waldo. <clears throat> so he had this group who got together, and then in 1181, the Archbishop of Lyon uh, <coughs> prohibited their preaching. He said, wait a minute, we don't want you preaching because, and this is the real reason, well, for various reasons. Oh, you, you know, you're just not good at it or whatever. Uh, but really what it was doing was making them angry uh, because they were attracting attention away from uh, the, the religious crowd, and they couldn't have that, so they were prohibited. And guess what happened? They preached more, <laughs> more and more. And so by the 13th century, the uh, Waldensians, this was their... Their name ultimately, uh, the Waldensians, uh, had spread the word of God in practically every corner of Europe at the time. So these Waldensians, Waldensians were known for their passionate evangelism. They took the name of Jesus with them and spread it wherever they went. They did it in simplicity, simplicity and grace so they were given over to passionate ministry. And by and by, many Waldensian beliefs entered the Protestant movement, but at a great cost. These people were persecuted. Uh, Rome wanted to stamp them out, and when they tried to stamp them out in one place, they would just move on, and the fire would start on another. And so e encouraging stories of pre-Reformation ministry, the Waldensians. Peter Waldo himself came under persecution. He just sort of vanished from the historical scene. But the word of God carried on in the hearts of those who stood with him. Now, this passionate evangelism was not only alive in this era, but it has been a part of the, of the church since the ascension of Christ. You have some poor examples of churches, then you have some good examples. You have people who were determined by the Holy Spirit to get the word out, and those people exist in every era. You may not see them or hear about them, but they're out there spreading the word. And one of the finest examples in church history was, took place in Thessalonica. This is one of the finest examples of Christian passion in, ev in evangelism. And no doubt it's fueled the, in, in, it fueled the desires of many in the church since. And uh, the Waldensians um, were, were good students of the word and no doubt were encouraged by the Thessalonican example and many others. The church of Thessalonica was special. And Paul knew this and he wanted to encourage them and by the Holy Spirit, we are encouraged today by their example. So here's the question we're going to bring up and seek to answer from the text. What does a heart for evangelism look like? What does a heart for evangelism look like? And this is, there are just four words I want to bring up. Walk through the text and drop down each word and, and talk about it. And then we're going to have an application at the end. What does a heart for evangelism look like? So, we've prayed, the text is being read, we've sung together concerning Christ, the desire to take his name with us. Now let's look at the text. Verse 8, Paul continues his discussion, his, his, his uh, presentation to the Thessalonians. He says, for not only has the word of the Lord, now the, the, those, those words, word of the Lord, what does that mean? It's talking about the gospel. So, not only has the word of the Lord, the Lord Jesus, sounded forth. Think of a trumpet. Think of somebody blowing a trumpet. I remember being in Toronto and uh, being in the subway. Now, if you're being in the subway, it's like being in a huge tube. Well, the British call it that, getting on the tube. And uh, <coughs> there was somebody down there with a case open and blowing a trumpet. And it was, I mean, what are you doing? 
you're bursting my eardrums. Are you asking me to give you money to stop? Uh, so in, in any case, and then no doubt you've seen folks uh, doing that, and maybe sometimes it's really great, but trumpet resounding. And that's the word that Paul is using, sounding forth, blasting. So what is he saying? For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth, trumpeted, gone out, high volume. And he says, for not only has the word of the Lord or the gospel sounded forth, that is on high volume, from you, from you, Thessalonians, in Macedonia and Achaia. And it's interesting to note that the people in Thessalonica Many of them would be Macedonians in the lineage of one of the most famous Macedonians, Alexander the Great. And Alexander went out and he conquered the known world and uh, took Greek with him. And isn't it interesting that God used that language to propagate the written word? In any case, these people were many of them in the church, were descendants of, in terms of the empire, descendants of Alexander the Great. But now, they're conquering the world with the gospel. But your faith in God, that's the gospel. What God has done for them, and what he wants God to do for others, has gone forth everywhere. That's called hyperbole. He wants to emphasize what God has done. In the known world, this is the word of God has spread everywhere. But your faith in God has gone everywhere so that we, not, we have not need to say anything. So what's the word here? It's earnest. A heart for evangelism is earnest. And now note this. They were so trumpeting and spreading the word, going out, risking their lives, Macedonia and Achaia. And guess what? So that the apostles didn't have to say anything. <laughs> it was so powerful that Paul said, I don't have anything to add. You've, <coughs> you've spread the word so completely and so well. I don't have anything to add. That's the Apostle Paul. So these people were earnest. They were thorough. They, were, they just decided they needed to go everywhere. This is the ancient world. They didn't have super eight motels. In... in in many ways, walking along the paths of the ancient world were just simply dangerous. But they're out there, and they're spreading the gospel. They're leaving their familiar surroundings, and they're going out and spreading it. That's exciting. So the first word, what does a heart for evangelism look like? A heart for evangelism is earnest. And they're so earnest that Paul said, hey, you know what? You did such a thorough job. So that we need not say anything. Wow. <laughs> That's quite a commendation coming from the Apostle Paul. Here's some application. Might we describe ourselves in this fashion, that is to say, earnest for the gospel, for the spreading of the gospel? Most modern seminars on evangelism focus on uh, technique and guilt. So you go in there, you get all this technique dumped on you. Then you leave guilty. Because you say, oh my goodness, I'm so, such a sloth. And that's where it sits. Or you get program ginned. That is to say, program, program, program. And everybody gets worn out and thinks, well, that's, we're done with evangelism for a good while. No, that's not earnestness. That's just a very big waste of time. So... Earnestness comes from the Holy Spirit and is a passion to win the lost. The Holy Spirit gives us a passion to win the lost. Earnestness. There's a direct purpose in mind. 
with deep feeling. Here's another question. Is our area covered so well that a godly evangelist would not have to come? And we say, we don't need a godly evangelist to come to this area because we've covered it so well. If we can say that's the way it is, then we're all right. But I can't say that. What does a heart for evangelism look like? A heart for evangelism is earnest. And I have to confess, when it comes to evangelism, very often I feel as cold as an ice cube. God help me. What does a heart for evangelism look like? First of all, there's an earnestness. This heart is earnest, direct in purpose, deep feeling for Christ, thorough. Then the next word is definite. A heart for evangelism is earnest, but it's also definite. Look at verse 9. For they themselves report. That is, the people in Macedonia and Achaia, what do they report? Concerning us, that is, the apostles. The kind of reception we had among you. That is to say, the Thessalonians, when they went around and they preached the gospel, they would say, this is what happened. Paul and his companions came we heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. We heard that all people are born into sin and that they can't do enough good works to save themselves from a place called hell. And then Paul went on to describe the necessity to repent, to turn away from a life of self-satisfaction and by the Holy Spirit trust in Jesus Christ who suffered died and rose again. And when they heard that gospel by the Holy Spirit, they became believers. And so they told the whole story. They were definite. They were clear. They were accurate. This is what happened. And they didn't hear it from the, uh, the uh, Thessalonians. They heard it from the Macedonians and Achaeans who were moved by the gospel of Jesus. So carry on. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols. They were very clear, very definite. Paul and his companions came and they said this, we turned from the idols to the living God. Now in this ancient world, if you're going to say that, you're going to put yourself in trouble. Because we're talking about ancient Rome here. You know, um, this isn't uh, Minneapolis. This is ancient Rome. Big, huge government operation full of idols. And in Thessalonica, especially, the idolatry was huge. And so now they're going to forsake that? Can you imagine what their pagan families would have said? Turning from idols to God. That is a radical amputation. They had definitely turned from their idols. Radical. And this no doubt caused their persecution. So they turned from their idols. They turned from dumb pieces of stone that uh, can't speak, they can't hear, and they receive Christ. Here are some application thoughts. Am I, are we, definite on what the gospel has done for us? The gospel of Jesus Christ, he has saved us. He has paid the penalty for our sin, believers. He suffered and died and rose again. We, by virtue of Christ, can now come to the Father in prayer and in word. And we, by virtue of the cross work, can say someday because of Christ, even though I die, yet shall I live. And when he comes again, and we'll talk about that in a moment, there will be a great union of the people of God with their Savior. That we can say definitely. Are we definite on what the gospel has done for us? 
and are we telling other people? Secondly, and here's something else, idols can take many different forms. Yesterday at the conference, the biblical counseling conference down in Cambridge, we had a great time. One of the sessions was on idolatry and the, uh, the confrontation of idols. The idols in the West are many. You have materialism. You have materialism. The love of money, the love of things, the love of security. We have that. We have other idols. We have the love of popularity. We desire to be popular. And so uh, we'll do whatever we, we, we can to be popular, even if it means that we sin. And then we have the love of the idols like drugs and alcohol. And I remember the days when I was held under the power of alcohol and God set me free. So, there is an idol. And it needs to be battled by the person of, of Christ. Christians can come under the, come under the wooing of, idol, of idols and by the power of the Holy Spirit can be set free. And there's the, the idol of, of pornography. That's a big one in our country. Huge. Huge. In the average church, you'll have one, maybe uh, one of four men are affected in some sense by pornography. And isn't that a big idol? And God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, can set people free even from that big monster. And you can't hide them. We have to, if we are believers, we must radically depart from such Idols, radically, declare war on them. And if you're not a believer, you'll never finally get free from them. They just switch idols. But only through the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus can you have true freedom. Are we definite in what the gospel has done for us? And are we, in that definiteness, warring against our idols? Warring. The things that the devil, the world, and the flesh will use to divide us from God or seek to do so. Let's go to war against those things that the enemy wants us to love in the place of Christ. And thirdly, a heart for evangelism is not only earnest and definite on what God has done and what he can do, and what he's called us to, he's called us to radical transformation as believers. And the third word is sacrificial. A heart for evangelism is sacrificial. Notice what the Bible says. Verse 9 repeated. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. To serve the living and the true God. Idols, they are dead. They represent death. But God is life. So the converts said that they turned to serve. The verb to serve implies slavery. We're no longer slaves to the world and slaves to these idols, but we are now slaves to Christ as believers in the Lord. So they sacrificed themselves to serve the living and true God. They gave themselves away. Why would they, they, why would they on an ongoing basis give themselves to dead things when, when God is the living God and they gave themselves fully and wholly to him to serve and to tell others about Jesus? And here's a question to consider. When it comes to evangelism, are we prepared to serve sacrificially? It's going to cost. It is going to cost Whenever we step foot outside of the door and get out into the world, it's going to cost. And it can cost everything that we have to bring the name of Jesus with us wherever we go. Take the name of Jesus here, 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 and here. It could even cost us our lives. So when it comes to evangelism, are we prepared to serve sacrificially? That's a tough question for me. Because I enjoy comforts, and I enjoy this and that, and I can see the, the, 
the uh, idolatry of materialism um, rising up in me often. And I hate it. And I ask, oh God, help me to walk after Christ, increasingly desiring what he wants, not what I want. So help me, Lord, to sacrifice for you. And then there's a last one that's hopeful, hopeful. The Bible says, and to wait, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, <coughs> Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now, this verb to wait, what does it mean? It means to, to wait, to pause, to be ready, to be ready for what is coming, to be eager in your waiting, in one's waiting. So there is an eagerness associated with this waiting. It is waiting with hope. It is waiting knowing that something is going to happen. When I go down, when I was uh, living in Halifax, I'd go and I would wait. I'd go to my digs to the university and I'd wait for the number 11 bus. And every single day, there was never a breakdown as far as I know, and uh, number 11 would show up. On I would get, and away I'd go. Off to class. Well, we wait for the second coming. Not that we, re oh, it may happen. No, it's going to happen. Waiting with hope, waiting with anticipation. Titus chapter 2. Here, here is a passage that is so full of delight. If you turn to Titus chapter 2, just before the book of Hebrews, of uh, Philemon and then Hebrews. Titus chapter 2 verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope for the appearing of the, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who were zealous for good works. Zealous for good works. So the blessed hope of the church is rooted in the second coming. There's our hope. This hope burned brightly in the, in the hearts of the believers. If you go back to 1 Thessalonians. This son comes from heaven. This son is going to come from heaven. The one for whom they are waiting is coming down. This son is the one whom the father raised up from the dead. That's Jesus. And this Jesus delivers us, the people of God, from the wrath to come. God's wrath will be poured out on the ungodly. Oh yes, we will receive persecution from the ungodly. We will receive tribulation. But I'll tell you what. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. But I'll tell you something else. Only upon the ungodly will come the wrath of God. Believers should not confuse their suffering with the wrath of God. Jesus, at his second coming, will deliver us from the just judgment of God against those who violate the law. Whatever shame and hardship Christians will face, the fortunes will be reversed on the day of judgment. That you can bank on. Christ is coming. So look at this. Waiting for his son from heaven, whom he, the father, raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. That was in the message that the Thessalonians brought to the people in Macedonia and Achaia. That's what they said. So, what can we say about this heart of evangelism. Here is this term, hopeful. And here's the question. When it comes to evangelism, are we prepared? Are we prepared? Are we, and what effect does this truth have on our lives? What effect does it have on our lives? Does it drive us to purity? Knowing that Christ could come at the bidding of the Father at any time. He can come. 
Oh, yeah, certain things must take place. That can happen very quickly. So Christ can come. Are we ready? Jesus warned us to be ready. He urged us to be ready as believers. So what effect does this truth have on our lives? Are we encouraged to purge ourselves of the idols about which we spoke earlier? So what does a heart for evangelism look like? A heart for evangelism is earnest, it's definite, it's sacrificial, and it's hopeful. Rooted in the second coming. Not hopeful in anything in this life. I hope that I have enough uh, when I finally can't work. That's not hope. Big deal. I hope that I can do whatever uh, next week. I hope that I can uh, get enough money so I can do this or that. Yeah, big deal. Hope is different in the Bible. It's trusting in the promises of God. Trusting in the promises of God because we know that they're true. There's nothing wrong with planning and doing what we must. Nothing wrong with that. This is supreme, of course. For the Christian, we hope for the day of Christ, on the day when all things will be put right. So here are some applications. These are the things that, you know, many seminars just stop right here. Okay, away you go, be guilty, and don't do anything. We want to pray for each other, for the church, that we might grow in these characteristics. God, help us, help me. Help me to grow in earnestness, in definiteness, in, in the sacrificial perspective, and hopefulness. Help me, Lord. Secondly, let's get together and talk about evangelism. We can go through some really great material, booklets, and so on. Go through a basic course by DVD. There's some great stuff available in, in library. We can walk through it together, talk about it, and then we're going to apply it, put it into action. Some of you are already doing it. The One Reach Five ministry. You take an individual or a couple. You can have five couples, five individuals, uh, a mixture for whom you are praying. And you can, you can begin to pray for these folks that God might open their hearts to believe. And then we can talk about how, what kind of ministry you want to, to bring about to, to reach into their, their lives in a loving and, and honest way. And there may be other opportunities to witness. We had Phil Fest this past weekend, which is great, great opportunity. Phil sharing the gospel in his community. And we have uh, folks who will be going out on the 22nd just handing out bread and talking to people. Building bridges so that we may share Christ. People go on the walks in the Twin Cities under the uh, watchful eye of people like Paul Drebla ministering grace to people in severe darkness. What other, what other venues can we use by God's grace to reach the lost in and around us here? We're right in close to us and around the community. How might we reach our dear neighbors? So put it into action. You're not alone. Just come, let's talk, let's work, let's pray. Let's get out there and do it by God's grace. That's it. That's all I want to do today. So now, we're going to close in prayer. Seminary intern Phil, would you close us, please? Psalm 134. Come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come to you humbly, knowing that we are sinners, knowing that we do fail you in every way, every day, Lord. And Father, we thank you for the message proclaimed through the word of God today, the message that speaks of those of Thessalonica who proclaimed your message, and that is the hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, and the faith we have in him, having been raised from the dead, after being crucified, to take our sins upon himself and to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. And now, Lord, we bless you. We bless the name of the God in heaven who looked down on us from heaven 
who called, who called us out of <clears throat> the depths of depravity, who called us out of sin, and who called us to be his children, who called us to be part of the inheritance with his son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we bless you, and may your blessing be upon everybody here. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This service is ended. <laughs>